Good afternoon. Welcome to Marquette University Law School's annual Hallows Lecture. It's my privilege as Dean of the Law School to introduce both today's lecture and speaker. Let me begin with the individual in whose memory this lecture stands. The Honorable E. Harold Hallows was a member of the Wisconsin Supreme Court from 1958 to 1974, concluding his tenure as Chief Justice of that court. These were dynamic years, important areas of the law, including aspects of constitutional law, criminal procedure, and tort law, underwent substantial change during this time. Justice Hallows played a significant role in these developments on the Wisconsin front. In addition to these contributions to the law generally, Justice Hallows was, for several decades before his appointment to the Wisconsin Supreme Court, Professor Hallows here at Marquette University Law School. A whole generation of students took courses such as Equity and Equity II from Professor Hallows. This was in addition to his full-time work as a practicing lawyer. For a decade and a half, then, the law school has held an annual Hallows Lecture in the late Chief Justice's memory. For that purpose today, we are privileged by the presence of the Honorable Paul Clement. Mr. Clement is recognized as one of the nation's premier advocates before the U.S. Supreme Court, to understate the point. He practices today in Washington, D.C., in the Bancroft Law Firm, an elite organization. Within the past two weeks alone, Mr. Clement has appeared before the court twice to argue cases, as he has done more than 60 other times over the past decade or so. It is a tribute to the regard, the esteem, in which Mr. Clement is held that he seems not much, if any less likely, to appear before the court today than when he served as the Solicitor General of the United States. The SG, of course, is the individual who handles pretty well all aspects of the United States government's practice before the Supreme Court of the United States. This is a position, the, the Solicitor General that Mr. Clement held from 2005 to 2008. There is so much more that one might say by way of introducing Paul Clement, whether it concerns his degrees from Georgetown, bachelor's, Cambridge, master's, or Harvard law, or for a point from which he evidently takes no less satisfaction, to judge from the firm's web website, as being a product of the public schools of Cedarburg, Wisconsin. This else might also include his service as a law clerk to Judge Lawrence Silberman of the D.C. Circuit and Justice Antonin Scalia of the U.S. Supreme Court. But even if it were possible to recount all of this would take time away from the Hallows Lecture itself. So, without more, please join me in welcoming to Marquette Law School the Honorable Paul D. Clement, who will provide something of a look back at the Affordable Care Act in the Supreme Court one year after. Well, thank you, Dean. It's always a pleasure for me to get back to Milwaukee. It is particularly a pleasure to be back to hear such a nice introduction and also for such a uh, wonderful event with such a distinguished audience. Uh, I really have sort of two challenges here today. One is to uh, live up to some of the previous Hallows lectures, which have been uh, extraordinary. Uh, the other uh, is really much more uh, self-imposed, I suppose, which is to try to say something about the health care case argued last year that hasn't already been said. Uh, in my experience in arguing before the court and watching the court even longer, uh, I've never seen a case that was so oversaturated in its coverage by the press and by the commentators on it. But I do have something of a unique perspective to add in the sense that I did have the great privilege of representing 26 states uh, in the litigation. And so what I want to provide is a little bit more of a uh, behind the scenes, if you will, and an advocate's perspective on the health care cases from last term. Uh, let me start by just talking a little bit about the arc of this case, because, or these cases, really, to be more accurate. Because, you know, many times a, a, a Supreme Court case will start out 
and as kind of an obvious case that's going to the Supreme Court or one that's a very weighty challenge. You can think of historic cases, the Pentagon Papers case, the Nixon tapes case. Those cases sort of started out and everybody could have recognized early on uh, that this was a case sort of destined to the, for the Supreme Court and destined to be closely decided. The health care case, uh, I think, had a slightly different arc to it or trajectory to it in that when it was first filed, uh, it was greeted pretty much uniformly with derision. Uh, it was it rejected in some quarters as being frivolous or sort of a political stunt, an effort by those that had lost the, uh, the votes in Congress to try to uh, resurrect things at the, uh, in the judiciary. And I guess I should say that even before the suit was filed, there's one thing that marked the health care case as being very different from some other major con constitutional controversies in recent years, and that is that when the issue was debated in Congress, the constitutional issues were not front and center. And you can contrast this, for example, with the debate over the McCain-Feingold Bipartisan Campaign Reform Act. In that instance, the congressional debate really was a constitutional debate. People were talking about the First Amendment, and it was really front and center. The issue of whether the individual mandate, in particular, in the health care law, was consistent with the Constitution and the Commerce Clause was barely mentioned during the long and contentious deliberative debates before the, in, in, in the Congress. And certainly the suggestion that perhaps there was something in the Medicaid provision that would violate limits on the spending power, as far as I know, was not mentioned, not one word was mentioned about that. So when these lawsuits were filed, as I said, they were initially dismissed by almost everyone as really not having too much behind them. Uh, Oren Kerr, who is a commentator on the Supreme Court who blogs at the, uh, the Vala Conspiracy, uh, and somebody who's not particularly, would not have been particularly hostile to the challenge, when it was first filed, gave it exactly a 1% chance of success. Uh, so that'll give you a flavor for it. Then something happened that really did change the dynamic a fair amount. And that is that Judge Henry Hudson uh, in the uh, Eastern District of Virginia uh, issued a decision, in fact, finding that the individual mandate was unconstitutional. And that was followed relatively quickly by other district court rulings. Judge Vinson down in Florida also held the individual mandate unconstitutional. And he went further and held as a matter of severability analysis that the entire act was unconstitutional and had to fall. A number of other district court judges rejected challenges in other parts of the country to the law. And commentators in looking at this drew uh, one conclusion from these various district court rulings, that you needed to know one thing about the district court judge to know how the district court ruled. If the district court was appointed by a Republican president, they held that the act was unconstitutional. If the district court judge was appointed by a Democratic president, they upheld the law as constitutional. Now, this was a particularly sort of pernicious conclusion, if you ask me, for people to draw. It's accurate, but pernicious. <laughs> because in many ways, the health care case, for a variety of reasons we can, we can try to uh, allude to later, was a case that was, for a constitutional case, was unusually closely watched not just by legal commentators, but by the general public. And so for the general public to be told that constitutional law is really just politics by other means, and all you need to know is the party of the president who appointed a district court judge to know how they will rule, that's a dangerous thing for people to have in mind. So fortunately, there was a tonic for this line of description of these cases. And the tonic was the courts of appeals. <laughs> Because when these cases were appealed to a variety of circuit courts across the country, a more nuanced picture arose. First of all, you had courts, including most prominently the Fourth Circuit Court of Appeals in Richmond, on the appeal from Judge Hudson's ruling, who basically decided that they didn't have to decide. The Fourth Circuit held that an obscure statute that dates back to the 1860s, the Anti-Injunction Act, precluded the court from exercising jurisdiction. In a nutshell, the Fourth Circuit said that the only way for somebody to challenge the health care law was to pay the tax penalty, ask for a refund, and then as part of the refund process, raise their constitutional challenge to the law. 
that would mean that we'd probably uh, have about three more years to wait before the Supreme Court would definitively rule on the constitutionality of the health care law. Uh, there are also rulings in the Sixth Circuit, the D.C. Circuit, and the Eleventh Circuit. The Eleventh Circuit was a case that I was involved in, and importantly there, a two-judge majority that involved both a President Bush 41 appointee and a President Clinton appointee struck down the law's individual mandate as unconstitutional. Uh, so you did have a judge from, appointed by a Democratic president who voted to strike down the individual mandate as unconstitutional. Conversely, in the Sixth Circuit and D.C. Circuit uh, cases, you had very distinguished, very well-respected court, court of Appeals judges appointed by Republican presidents, such as Jeff Sutton, last year's lecturer, and Judge Lawrence Silverman, for whom I clerked on the D.C. Circuit, voting to uphold the law's constitutionality. So this sort of simple narrative that all you need to know is the president that appointed the judge did break down. And I think that was every bit as healthy as the prior sort of explanation was pernicious. Um, and then we'll talk about the case as it comes to the Supreme Court in a moment. Let me say by, by way of my own involvement in this case a word about my own sort of arc of involvement in this case. So I was not involved in this case, this is typical for an appellate lawyer, I suppose, uh, when it was originally filed. So as this case worked its way through the district court, uh, and the case I eventually became involved in was the Florida case, um, I was a sort of, you know, an, a bystander, uh, an innocent bystander, if you will. Um, I, I had a few other things on my plate, so I did not instantly drop everything and read the pleadings in the case or the briefs in the case. Uh, I did have occasion, though, on, on, in one instance, to be asked my view on the case. I was on an NPR show uh, with uh, Walter Dellinger, who was much more actively involved in the case at that point, and the commentator asked us both for our thoughts on the case, and Walter had a strong opinion uh, that the suit was frivolous. And I was asked my opinion, and I said, with caveats that I haven't really looked at this, I, I said, based on my own experience in the SG's office, defending the constitutionality of acts of Congress against challenges that they were in excess of Congress's commerce power and the like, that the challenge for the government would be to articulate a limiting principle. Because in my experience, if the government can articulate a limiting principle, they win. And if they can't articulate a limiting principle, they tend to lose these cases. And the reason is simple. I think everybody understands that in the wake of the New Deal cases, the commerce power of Congress is very broad. But everybody also recognizes that the commerce power is not a plenary power. It's not like the police power that most states enjoy. And the simplest explanation for why that's the case is that the framers went to a lot of trouble to articulate the various powers granted to the federal Congress in Article I, Section 8. And it was a lot of trouble to go through if, when they said commerce, they meant and everything else. Uh, they really could have stopped the commerce or just said police power. And so you start with the proposition that the challenge for the federal government is to explain why this very broad commerce power is not so broad that it is unlimited and essentially is a plenary power. So I said all that before I got involved. Um, I did have the privilege of getting involved at the Court of Appeals stage, so when there was a favorable district court decision. But at that point, as it moved its way to the Court of Appeals, uh, my clients, basically the states, ultimately 26 of the states, uh, decided that this case had a good chance to go to the Supreme Court. It was probably the time to hire an advocate who could take it through the Court of Appeals and to the Supreme Court. Now, one thing I should stop and say there is my clients at this point, I think, were quite sure that their case was going to go to the Supreme Court of the United States because, after all, there were 26 states challenging an act of Congress something that was virtually unprecedented for a majority of the states to join a legal challenge to an act of Congress. I've seen amicus briefs on multiple states, but to actually initiate litigation against an act of Congress is unconstitutional with a majority of the states is, in my experience, really unprecedented. And so I think they just took it for granted that their case would be the one of these various cases throughout the nation that would make their way to the Supreme Court. I was a lot more skeptical myself because I looked around and, if anything, the 11th Circuit proceedings were a little bit behind the other cases that were in the 4th Circuit, in the D.C. Circuit, in the, in the 6th Circuit. Um, and so 
there was nothing really to do other than to sort of litigate at the Court of Appeals level and see. We did try one thing uh, that I think ultimately may have contributed to the fact that our case did become the vehicle for the Supreme Court's review, which is in an effort to essentially jump the queue a little bit on some of the other cases, we asked for something extraordinary from the 11th Circuit, which was initial en banc review. So rather than the normal process of going to a court of appeals panel of three, uh, and then the dissatisfied party has the option of going to the Supreme, uh, going to en banc rather, before a Supreme Court cert petition is filed, we tried to do that from the very beginning and asked the 11th Circuit to take it en banc. They declined the invitation and we were before the panel, which as I say, su you know, suggested we were very much near the end of the queue of these various cases that were working their way through the courts of appeals. Uh, we did, however, uh, catch something of a break that did, in fact, catch us up. And that is, we won in the Court of Appeals. Uh, the other Court of Appeals cases uniformly involve situations where the challenger's challenge was rejected. So the Fourth Circuit, as I alluded to, rejected the challenge on jurisdictional grounds. Uh, the Sixth Circuit, sort of next in line, rejected the challenge. Uh, and then the D.C. Circuit was actually even further behind the Eleventh Circuit case but ultimately ex rejected the challenge. But the 11th Circuit in this two-to-one decision upheld, uh, uh, upheld our challenge, struck down the individual mandate as unconstitutional. Now, that didn't guarantee that the Supreme Court would take our case because the federal government, in a sense, had the opportunity to decide what to do next. All the challengers who lost at the panel stage they were all looking around, and they could see other cases that could get to the Supreme Court. So they all filed petitions immediately. Uh, if the government had decided to seek en banc review in the 11th Circuit, uh, it probably, in my best guess, we would be actually, about this year, would have the, uh, the constitutionality of the Affordable Care Act before the Supreme Court, because it would have taken a number of additional months for that case to go before the en banc court, for the en banc court to decide whether they would even take the case. And that would have also provided a pretty good argument for the court waiting on the other cases that were waiting for the Supreme Court's review because the, the federal government would be able to say, well, why don't you decide whether the 11th Circuit will take this en banc because if the 11th Circuit uh, takes this en banc and says the law is constitutional, then there'll be no circuit split. Every court that have looked at, has looked at this, every court of appeals will have upheld the constitutionality of the law. So the, the federal government, in a sense, is the one that ultimately decided that the 11th Circuit case would be the vehicle for the Supreme Court's review. Because having lost their, their, their challenge in the 11th Circuit, the, 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 the SG filed the petition for certiorari in the 11th Circuit case. And then the Supreme Court took that petition, as well as the cross petitions filed by the challenger, both the 26 states and the NFIB and a few other individual private plaintiffs. And the court took all those cases and said, this is the case that we're going to review. But they did something when they granted that case for review that from the perspective of Supreme Court practitioners was truly extraordinary, which is on their own motion, they did two things that I don't think anybody expected. One is they took these cases, and they were a little complicated. There was the government's petition asking for review of the individual mandate. There was the, the, the petition filed by the, both the private parties in the 26 states and they wanted the court to look at a couple of things. The states, my clients, wanted to have, have the court also look not just at the individual mandate, but at whether the Medicaid provisions were consistent with Congress's spending power. Uh, the states and the private practitioners, uh, pr uh, challengers, also wanted the court to look at a severability issue. Because if the individual mandate is unconstitutional, that begs the question of, well, okay, or prompts the question, rather, what else in the statute is unconstitutional? Does just this one provision get struck down, or does the whole law go? And so the, the states and the private parties asked the court to look at that issue as well. And then there was this lurking jurisdictional issue about the Anti-Injunction Act, which the Fourth Circuit had decided. Now, that really didn't get any play at all in the Eleventh Circuit case, but nonetheless, the parties told, both parties told the Supreme Court that if you're interested in that issue, you can always ask for briefing on it. We'd be happy to provide it. So that's what the, what the court had before it. And as I said, the court did two things that were really unprecedented. One, it took these cases and basically turned them into four separate cases. And they asked for separate briefing and ultimately separate argument on four different issues. 
jurisdiction, the Anti-Injunction Act, on the constitutionality of the individual mandate, the main event, so to speak, that I think everybody was most interested in, the severability question, namely the consequences if, of what would happen if the individual mandate was struck down as unconstitutional, and then separately the Medicaid challenge. So they essentially took these cases that had all been argued together, all these issues had been argued together before the 11th Circuit, and they broke them into four separate cases. The second thing they did that was unprecedented and, at least by modern standards, even more surprising is they set aside five and a half hours for oral argument. And that may not seem like a lot since this is, after all, a pretty big deal and there are four separate issues that have to be addressed. But to put that in perspective, the Supreme Court will decide the thorniest of consequential constitutional issues and almost invariably gives half an hour aside, an hour total. So, you know, pick your issue, whether it's partial birth abortion, whether it's race and affirmative action, those are issues that routinely the Supreme Court dispatches in an hour total for the case. And yet here the court gave five and a half hours of argument time, ultimately expanded it to six hours of argument time, but all on its own motion, which is really, I think, an extraordinary suggestion of how seriously the Supreme Court itself took the underlying challenges in this case. And again, just to give you a little bit of perspective on that five and a half hours of argument time, uh, I had the experience when I was in the Solicitor General's office of being involved in a case that I thought was, you know, of, of, of quite significant sweep and moment, which was the constitutional challenges to the, 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 the Bipartisan Campaign Form, Reform Act or the McCain-Feingold Act that I, I mentioned earlier. And that was a case that got to the Supreme Court, again, one where everybody knew this was coming, the First Amendment issues were coming. And Congress in that case actually put in a provision into the statute for expedited Supreme Court review. So there's a special three-judge district court convene and an immediate review to this appellate review to the Supreme Court of the United States. And there was a preference for getting all these cases together. So the courts essentially consolidated 11 separate, separate uh, cases in one case where I think something like 18 separate provisions of the law were challenged as violating the First Amendment or another provision of the Constitution. All of that was dealt with in a, in a three-judge district court that produced a 1,400-page set of opinions on which only two judges could only agree about, about 23 pages of the 1,400. Um, so there was this sprawling monstrosity of a case that had to go before the Supreme Court of the United States. And I remember we sort of felt the obligation in the SG's office to try to make this case look more like a normal case and more manageable for the Supreme Court. And we literally sat around and asked ourselves, given all the different issues, 18 separate constitutional issues, what is the absolute maximum amount of argument time we could possibly ask for the court to hear in the McCain-Feingold case? And the answer we came up with was four. Two hours in the morning, two hours in the afternoon, all one day. That seemed to us to be the outer limit of what one could plausibly ask the modern Supreme Court to hear a case in, given that it typically only has an hour to dispatch these cases. And the court, in fact, gave us the four hours in that case, which is essentially the modern record for the length of an argument. Starting in about 1970, the Supreme Court became much more insistent on this one hour per case rule. So since basically 1970, the longest case had been the McCain-Feingold case, clocking in at about four hours. So this was fully 150% of that. And again, just to give you a couple of historical analogs, United States against Nixon, the Nixon tape cases, kind of a big deal, two hours. New York Times against the United States, the famed Pentagon Papers case, another sort of a big deal, three hours of argument. Uh, you have to go back way into the 60s to the Miranda case, uh, six hours of argument. That's, that's, you have to go back that far. Uh, that, that appears to be about 1.5 hours per warning, as I count it. Um, but <laughs> but still, still, still impressive. So. Um, but another, so that's one way of thinking about the perspective on this, is just an extraordinary amount of, uh, of time from the Supreme Court of the United States. Now, another just sort of shot of perspective, though, even after the Supreme Court grants six hours of argument time to this case, uh, there were still those who were really questioning the seriousness 
of the underlying constitutional challenges. And I'll just give you two quotes from a couple of weeks before the argument, the week or two before the argument. Uh, about a week before the argument, Linda Greenhouse, the, the famed Pulitzer Prize winning uh, Supreme Court reporter, former Supreme Court reporter for the New York Times, uh, wrote uh, a piece where she talked about uh, the cases and the challenge, particularly the Commerce Clause challenge. And she said, quote, free of convention and fresh from reading the main briefs in the case to be argued before the Supreme Court next week, I'm here to tell you that the belief that there is a serious constitutional issue here is simply wrong. The constitutional challenge to the law's requirement for people to buy health insurance, specifically the argument that the mandate exceeds Congress's power under the Commerce Clause, is rhetorically powerful, but analytically so weak that it dissolves on close inspection. There's just no there there. Uh, for, for another view, uh, again, on the very eve of the argument, uh, my friend Walter Dellinger, I was quotable, uh, had, had the following to say in Politico. You know how they say people were saying it's frivolous and they're not saying that anymore? Referring to the fact they were saying it was frivolous at the beginning of the case. But they're not saying that anymore? Walter Dellinger, an acting solicitor general in the Clinton administration, asked in an interview, well, I'm still saying it's frivolous. So from that perspective... Let me talk a little bit about the challenge of getting ready for this, this argument. Um, as I said, the Supreme Court did two extraordinary things, the five and a half, then six hours of argument, but also breaking this in to four separate cases. Each one of those cases, jurisdiction, individual mandate, severability, and the Medicaid challenge, each one of those had its own separate briefing schedule. Uh, each one of those had its own allocated time for argument. Now, a couple of thoughts about that. First of all, in terms of just the challenges for the party. So four cases, four separate briefing schedules. Sadly, only one set of lawyers for the states. So in the period of a couple of months, really, I mean, the, the, the briefing schedule is no longer than an ordinary case. Uh, the challenge for the states and their lawyers was to file seven briefs, seven merits briefs, there's basically two in each of the cases and only one in the, in the individual mandate case because that was the one where we were effectively the bottom side, the respondents, not the, uh, not the petitioners. So seven briefs over that, over that short period of time. Uh, but the other thing that was so fascinating about this is that with these four separate cases and being so unusual for the Supreme Court, it really changed the dynamic in a fundamental way. And the best way to illustrate this is to compare it to the 11th Circuit argument, where all these issues were grouped together for a single argument. When we walked out of the 11th Circuit argument, my clients in that case, like every client I've ever had, wants to know, well, what do we think? How'd it go? And certainly speaking for myself, but I think for most lawyers, yeah, yeah, I always hate to be asked that question right afterwards. First of all, you're still processing it. Second of all, you don't want to say, awesome, we can't lose. <laughs> because sometimes you lose. On the other hand, you don't want to get your client you know, down in the dumps. But what I was able to say to try to point to something fairly objective to give my client was to say, look, it's a very good sign that we got a lot of questions from the panel about severability. Because if you're not going to strike down any part of the statute as unconstitutional, you're not terribly worried about what the impact on the rest of the statute is from striking down a provision as unconstitutional. But if you're asking multiple questions, the premise of which is, what happens if we strike down the individual mandate? I mean, that's not a bad sign. But in the Supreme Court, you wouldn't be able to get that kind of feedback because they were going to have 90 minutes of argument on severability, no matter how the argument on the individual mandate on the merits went. And you can imagine the scenario, which fortunately was not the scenario, where it was crystal clear from the argument on the individual mandate that the mandate would survive. And that would have led probably to the most boring 90 minutes in the history of the Supreme Court talking about severability, which is truly, would have been truly an academic question. So the court, by divvying up these issues, uh, maybe it sent a signal that at least some of the justices figured there would be a meaningful argument on severability. But in all events, they really changed the dynamic. Another thing about dividing it up in these four ways, is the court then did something which is pretty extraordinary. Is it appointed not one but two court-appointed amici to argue parts of the various cases. Now, those that watch the court and are very familiar with the court will know that from time to time, 
there's a un relatively unusual situation where a party, usually the Solicitor General, will confess error and, and not defend the judgment of the court below. And in those circumstances, the court typically will appoint an amicus to defend the judgment below while the parties basically agree with each other about how erroneous the Seventh Circuit or the Sixth Circuit or the Fifth Circuit decision is. And somebody is appointed by the court to defend the judgment. Uh, here, they appointed two different amici. One, to defend the severability analysis of the Eleventh Circuit. Because the Eleventh Circuit said the individual mandate was unconstitutional. But the Eleventh Circuit went on to say that nothing else in the statute is affected by that. Um, and we wanted to say that if the individual mandate goes, the whole thing goes. And the federal government wanted to say that if the individual mandate was unconstitutional, a couple of closely related provisions, the guaranteed issue and community rating provisions, would fall with the individual mandate. So there's nobody there to defend the judgment of the 11th Circuit on the severability analysis. So a distinguished Supreme Court practitioner was appointed to defend that judgment. And then, as I mentioned, the, both the, the federal government and the states in, in, in putting this case before the Supreme Court told the Supreme Court that this Anti-Injunction Act jurisdictional issue, uh, if you want briefing on that, it's jurisdictional. So it can arise in any case. So you can do that in our case. Uh, but the issue really didn't get any play. So the court effectively appointed an amicus to brief essentially the position that the Fourth Circuit had adopted in a different case. And I'm not sure the court has ever done anything quite like that. But in a sense, this was part of the, uh, the, str the, the, the strategy that was employed, I think, both by the federal government and by the challengers in this case to try to get the Eleventh Circuit case as the one case up there where the Supreme Court could address all of these issues. And the choice for the Supreme Court was really to grant the Eleventh Circuit case alone and have this Anti-Injunction Act briefed by an amicus, or to have take the Eleventh Circuit case and the Fourth Circuit case, taking the Fourth, Fourth Circuit case for the sole purpose of bringing up the jurisdictional issue. So they did this where you had basically the four separate cases. They were spread out over an entire week of the Supreme Court's calendar. So almost exactly a year ago this week, I mean this month, in uh, the end of the March calendar, the whole second week of the March sitting was dedicated to the health care case. The Anti-Injunction Act on day one, the individual mandate on day two, severability in the Medicaid challenge on day three. So one of the other challenges then for the advocates is it's daunting enough to get ready for a single Supreme Court argument. But to get ready essentially for four is really something quite extraordinary. And there was some relief for, for me personally, which is that my, one of my co-counsel, who represented the individual challengers, decided that they would take the, uh, the jurisdictional issue on the Anti-Injunction Act. So day one was taken care of. Now, that doesn't mean we got an entirely free pass, because there were arguments that the state had that were slightly different from the private plaintiffs on the jurisdictional issue. So we had to attend this other advocate's moot courts and make sure that the positions taken were ones that we agreed with and could live with. But at least that piece of it was out. But that left three arguments that had to be covered. And my own belief is, as I told some of the students earlier today, is that moot courts are incredibly important, in fact, indispensable for getting ready for a Supreme Court argument. And I typically do two Supreme Court moot courts before every Supreme Court argument. And so the prospect of doing six moot courts uh, in basically the week or week and a half before the argument uh, was a bit much, so I settled on five. Um, and I, I did this, I effectively had one moot court just on the individual mandate issues, one moot court on severability, one moot court on both the mandate and severability, where I inflicted on these moot court judges having to sit through both parts of the argument, and then I did two separate moots on the Medicaid issue, since that was the most discreet of the various issues implicated in the case. So with four separate cases effectively before the court on these different issues, and everybody paying attention to this case because of its effect not only on constitutional doctrine, but also the unique dynamic that a president's signature legislative accomplishment and its constitutionality was an issue in essentially a re-election cycle. Uh, with all that attention, as you can imagine, uh, there were a few uh, people who were not parties to the litigation that were interested in filing an amicus brief. Um, in fact, there were 129 amicus briefs filed across the four cases. I can assure you some of those have still not been read. 
But a very few of them actually did move the needle. In particular, there was a, a, an amicus brief that was filed by some economists, both in the 11th Circuit and in the Supreme Court, uh, on behalf of the states that got a fair amount of play at the oral argument and indeed was mentioned specifically by Justice Alito in a couple of his questions. So there's a lesson there that even in a sea of 129 amicus briefs, an amicus brief that really tackles a discrete and different issue and provides the court with a distinct perspective on the case, as opposed to a Me Too perspective on the case, can make a difference in the court's deliberations. Now, with all of these issues before the Supreme Court, of course, there were a number of strategic calls and tactical calls that had to be made. To just give you one for instance, uh, one of the questions that was before the court in considering the individual mandate's constitutionality was, of course, the commerce power. And that was the principal focus of most of the analysis of the case, both beforehand and after the argument. But a, another important constituent of the challenge to the individual mandate was the Necessary and Proper Clause. And the Necessary and Proper Clause, or as it's sometimes called the Sweeping Clause, is the clause of the Constitution that sort of rounds out the other powers. So you have the enumerated powers for Congress and then the additional authorization to do what's necessary and proper to bring those other powers into effect. And Chief Justice Marshall famously interpreted this in the McCullough case involving the Bank of the United States and interpreted the necessary and proper clause very broadly. But as the clause's very name suggests, there's kind of two ways to tackle the necessary and proper clause if you're an advocate challenging an act of Congress. You can either try to say that the act of Congress and the power and the way Congress exercised it was unnecessary, or you can say that it was improper. And on this very basic issue, the states and the private parties took slightly different tacks. And I think it's fair to say that the private parties uh, focused more on necessary and decided to put more of their argument on the details of how the statute worked and whether or not by putting the broad individual mandate on everyone, the individual mandate really was necessary to effectuate Congress's purposes. We, representing the states, and perhaps this is natural given the clients that we had, but we took, put much more focus on the proper part of the clause and suggested that when Congress, even when it's exercising a constitutional power like the commerce power, and even when it's exercising a complementary power to implement the commerce power, it must do so in a way that's respectful of our basic constitutional uh, sort of traditions, including our traditional respect for state sovereignty, and therefore the enactment of the individual mandate was, whether it was necessary or not, was not a proper exercise of Congress's power. But that just gives you just one instance in the many of how these various uh, challenges were brought. As I mentioned uh, before, the moot courts were critical to this venture, as they are in every uh, Supreme Court argument that I've ever done. Um, in particular, I know at one of my moot courts, I was berated by one of the justices. And at the time, when you're, you never like your moot justices berating you. But you always thank them after the, kit, after the fact. And I was berated by one of the justices about why wasn't this just necessary and proper clause issue just decided in McCullough? Uh, the Bank of America, you know, what, what, what the, the, the Bank of the United States, what, there's so much discretion to, uh, to, uh, to, to the federal government and to Congress in exercising this power. And I thought long and hard about this series of questions, and it occurred to me in part of the discussion afterwards uh, that the best answer to that line of questions was to remind the court that, you know, there has to be a limit on the necessary and proper power, just like there has to be a limit on all of the powers granted to Congress in Article I, Section 8. And no matter how broad the power was in the McCulloch case, that maybe the Supreme Court would have had a different perspective if people had actually been forced to put deposits in the Bank of the United States, which would be far more comparable uh, to the individual mandate. And sure enough, at the actual argument, Justice Breyer asked me a question that only Justice Breyer uh, could ask, which is to say it had many parts. Um, and one of the parts focused on the... McCullough case and the Bank of the United States. And thanks to that moot court, I was able to give exactly that answer, that this is completely distinguishable because back then nobody forced anybody to put their deposits in the Bank of the United States. So just an illustration of how important the uh, moot courts can be. So I mentioned that there were four separate cases 
essentially before the court. But even that understates it a little bit, because there were really six separate issues. There's the four I mentioned, jurisdiction, Anti-Injunction Act, severability, Medicaid. But on the individual mandate, there really were three separate issues, because the government had sort of three strings to its bow, if you will. They had three arguments about what constitutional power supported the individual mandate. They said it was a valid exercise of the commerce power, as I've mentioned, they said it was a valid exercise of the necessary and proper power. And at the very back of their brief, they mentioned the taxing power as an additional authority that would support the statute. So one way of thinking about the challenger's burden in this case was they really had to run the table on those three issues because any one of those powers would be sufficient to sustain the constitutionality of the individual mandate. And to make the challenge even more daunting, Four justices had made pretty clear in prior cases that they were not going to be receptive to an argument that limited Congress's power in this area. So there were really five justices who might be receptive to arguments for limiting the commerce power and the necessary and proper power. And so with five justices and three issues, the challenge for the challengers was essentially to run the table to the tune of going 15 for 15. So the good news is, the challengers went 14 for 15. <laughs> the bad news from the perspective of my clients is 14 out of 15 isn't good enough. Um, as I mentioned to the students earlier today, getting a really satisfying opinion for four justices still counts as a loss. But nonetheless, I want to say, and, and this is really where I'll, where I'll end, uh, but I want to say four things about the decision that emerged from the Supreme Court. Um, the first thing, and the one that may be, I suppose, most surprising, because it's not how it was reported in the newspapers the next morning, but I think it is a very fair statement, a very fair summary of the health care case, that the individual mandate was struck down as unconstitutional. Now, you may say that's delusional thinking from a lawyer who argued the case unsuccessfully, but in reality, the court's decision on this point, and particularly the Chief Justice's opinion, which was the decisive opinion on this, really does support the proposition that the statute that Congress actually passed, which put a mandate on individuals to purchase health care insurance, was in fact struck down as an excess of Congress's power under the commerce power and the necessary and proper power. And only by essentially reinterpreting the provision, not as a mandate on individuals buying insurance, but as a tax on those who do not buy insurance, was the court able to save the statute. Not the statute that actually passed that imposed the individual mandate, but to save the statute essentially is reconfigured as a tax on the status of being uninsured. And I see a few skeptical looks in the audience. So I go to the text of the opinion itself. And first of all, the court goes to great lengths to point out that the tax power version of the statute is really fundamentally different from the individual mandate. So to quote from the Chief Justice, the government's tax power argument asks us to view the statute differently than we did in considering its commerce power theory. In making its commerce clause argument, the government defended the mandate as a regulation requiring individuals to purchase health care insurance. The government does not claim that the taxing power allows Congress to issue such a command. Instead, the government asks us to read the mandate not as ordering individuals to buy insurance, but rather as imposing a tax on those who do not buy that product. And just to give you a few other for instances, the Chief Justice, again, under the tax theory, the mandate is not a legal command to buy insurance. It is instead just a tax hike on certain taxpayers who do not have health insurance. And the court, importantly, the Chief Justice in particular, conceded that this tax power reading of the statute was not the most straightforward reading. He said, quote, the most straightforward reading of the mandate is that it commands individuals to purchase insurance. And perhaps the most interesting part of this is that there was an exchange uh, with the Chief Justice and Justice Ginsburg on this particular point, where the Justice Ginsburg made the quite legitimate point that, wait a second, if you're ultimately going to uphold the statute as a valid exercise of the taxing power, why are you bothering saying anything about the commerce power and the necessary and proper power? And I'm paraphrasing here, but Justice Ginsburg effectively said, listen, Mr. Judicial Restraint, I mean, well, what's judicially restrained about issuing sort of a gratuitous holding on the commerce power and the necessary and proper power, a holding for which there are five justices, because the four dissenters certainly agreed a fortiori, what are you doing 
if you're ultimately going to uphold the statute on an alternative ground. And in responding to this, the Chief Justice specifically said that he had to reach the commerce power, the necessary and proper power issues first, because that's the way the statute most naturally read. And so in order to be judicially restrained, he had to consider the arguments against the statute as Congress effectively passed it, and only after rejecting those arguments could he consider the alternative arguments. So in responding to Justice Ginsburg, he said, quote, the statute reads more naturally as a command to buy insurance than as a tax, and I would uphold it as a command if the Constitution allowed it. The last thing I'll say, just two more quotes, is to make clear how, how much the Court's opinion, or the Chief Justice's opinion in all events, makes this distinguish, distinction. He says, quote, the federal government does not have the power to order people to buy health insurance. The federal government does have the power to impose a tax on those without health insurance. So at least for the Chief Justice, I think it's fair to say, and he was obviously the four dissenting justices joined him a fortiori, the individual mandate was struck down as unconstitutional. But the statute was saved as reformulated as a taxing power statute. So the second thing I'll say about the court's opinion is how remarkable is that? The Supreme Court had six hours of argument on this case, and the taxing power argument got maybe generously three minutes of the six hours. Because, as I said, there was, there were, there was the argument, a full hour argument plus on the Anti-Injunction Act. And in that context, there was some discussion of whether the mandate was a tax, and if it was a tax, whether the only way to challenge it was through the refund procedure. But that wasn't the court's ruling. In fact, the Chief Justice rather famously said, for statutory purposes, we take Congress as a given, and they said it wasn't a tax, so it's not a tax. So for those purposes, uh, it's not a tax. But for constitutional purposes, it could be configured as a tax. So it was in the individual mandate argument, if at all, that the taxing power would come up. Um, and in the, tax, in the individual mandate argument, 99% of the focus was on the commerce power and the necessary and proper power. So I guess another takeaway from today's lecture is six hours was not enough. <laughs> they needed more time to talk about the taxing power argument. So let me say just two more things about the opinion before I, I pause and take some questions. Uh, the third thing I'll say about the opinion is the Medicaid, the spending power argument, sort of the silent part of this case, the part nobody really focused on that much, which may turn out to be the single most important part of this case. On that, seven justices, not five, not four, seven justices said that the statute exceeded Congress's power under its spending power because it was too coercive of the states. They effectively had no realistic choice but to accept the Medicaid funds because of the way that they structured the program, particularly the fact that uh, Congress tied the new expanded Medicaid program to the old program. So even states that wanted nothing to do with the new program and the new money but were perfectly happy with the program they had and had had for 35 years, they faced a choice of losing all their Medicaid funds if they didn't take the new money. And seven justices said that was a bridge too far. Now, the reason I think this is so significant is because for small p political reasons, I rather doubt we're going to have a lot of new individual mandates. I mean, whatever you think about the constitutional issue, I don't think politically that played that well in the long run. But spending power legislation is endemic throughout the federal statute books. The United States Code is full of spending power legislation. And if you care about federalism, spending power issues are very important because the basic doctrine of the court is the very few things you can't do through the commerce power and the necessary and proper power, you can still get states to do if you make it a condition of receiving federal funds. And there are so many federal funds, which of course are taken from state taxpayers, um, that if you can basically without limit put conditions on the states and say, if you want this bucket of federal funds, you must agree to the following conditions, then there is no practical limit on federalism at all. And the court, by saying that there is a step that Congress can go that's too far, has, I think, breathed some life into federalism and the spending power. And we'll see where it goes. I, I mean, you know, this is precisely because Medicaid is the largest single federal grant program and dwarfs other programs, it will be easy enough for the court in subsequent cases to say, well, you know, this isn't anywhere nearly as coercive as that because there's not nearly as much money at stake in this program as there was in the Affordable Care Act and the Medicaid case. So it'll be distinguishable if they want, but it will also be extendable if they want. 
And I think the difference between that will really uh, make the difference as to whether this becomes recognized as the single most important aspect of this case or not. But I think there's really that potential. And then the last thing I'll say about this case is to just pose for a moment the, the counterfactual hypothetical of what would have happened if the case had come out the other way. You know, there is some discussion about this case. It's certainly an important case. And I think given the amount of attention paid to the case, there's an argument that it was a real constitutional moment. But I think in some respects, it was a constitutional moment averted. Because the court, in a decision that is five to four on virtually all aspects of except the spending power, ultimately upheld the statute under the spending power rationale. But in the process, the Chief Justice, joined by the four dissenting justices, imposed substantial limits on the commerce power, the necessary and proper power. And as I say, seven justices voted to put limits on the spending power. And if they had gone the other way and basically said, as four justices were willing to, and a lot of commentators thought they would be willing to, and say, basically, but for a few unusual circumstances like the Lopez case and maybe the Prince case, there are really no limits on federalism. Then I think that would have really been the constitutional moment and the momentous holding of the court. And I'll, quote with a, I'll, I'll close with a quote from Justice Kennedy uh, in his Lopez concurrence by sort of, in sort of his celebration of federalism and say just one thing after the quote. He says, federalism was the unique contribution of the framers to political science and political theory. Though on the surface the idea may seem counterintuitive, it was the insight of the framers that freedom was enhanced by the creation of two governments, not one. And that was really the question at the heart of the Affordable Care Act, was whether federalism would continue to be a meaningful limit on the power of the federal government. And although the health care case in the end was not decided exactly the way the challengers had hoped, I do think in some respects the single most important takeaway from the decision was there were not five votes to say that there really is no meaningful judicial review of federalism constraints on Congress. There are constraints. Again, the power is very substantial, very broad in the wake of the New Deal precedents of the court, but it remains a limited power, and the challenge for the federal government in future cases will remain putting a limiting principle on an assertion of Congress's power. So with those thoughts, I'd have to take some questions. Thank you. That was outstanding. We do have time for some questions, so if you want to raise your hand and I will uh, recognize you, please. To the extent you can, if you can lean forward or your neighbor can and hold the button down so that folks in the back of the room can hear the question, please. Hi. Um, thank you very much for this lecture. It was very interesting. But do you know, in the future, will Congress be able to write legislation that requires people to buy broccoli? <laughs> well, and, and it's a very fair question, and I think the answer is probably not. Now, I suppose the question will be whether the broccoli mandate can be reconceptualized as a tax on not possessing broccoli. Um, and I think that's a little harder to do with broccoli than it was with health insurance. And I suppose that will be the debate in the next case. But I think that, you know, it, it, as I suggested, I think if the case had come out more definitively in the government's favor and there had been five justices that said, no, that this is valid commerce power legislation, I think that we know the answer to that question. And sure, Congress can mandate that. Congress can mandate whatever it wants. And the only constraint is the political process, which may be a significant constraint. But in a sense, I do think that that's where the Chief Justice, by relying on the taxing power, may have made a material difference in the, in, in the true practical extent of Congress's power. Because I think the concern is that under the commerce power, there's not a lot of obvious political constraint on the federal government. If it seems like a good idea, and constituents generally support it as a good idea, then there isn't much of a practical constraint from a federalism standpoint. But the next time there's a, there's, there's a broccoli mandate, or whatever the mandate is, I think based on this Supreme Court decision, 
there'll be no question that that new mandate can only be supported and only be justified to the extent that it's a tax. And I think that will fundamentally shift the debate in Congress. Because if we know that if there's one thing in which political checks can actually make a meaningful difference, it's no new taxes. And so, you know, and, and I do think, you know, in reality, one of the reasons why we had this individual mandate was because nobody wanted to impose a new tax right then. And the mandate, which has many of the same functions of a tax, I mean, you can think of it as really being a tax on relatively healthy, relatively young people who wouldn't voluntarily buy health insurance, but it wasn't denominated a tax. And the next time around, thanks to this decision, I think it will have to be defended as a tax, and I think that may be impossible to do politically. Other questions? I know I saw a hand up. Yes, Bill. Um, well, I'm a little concerned about a couple of statements Chief Justice Roberts made about the taxing power. Or did that, at that time, were you, uh, were you not thinking much along the, the way the Chief eventually came out and decided the case? Well, I can say two things. Um, about that. One is, as I mentioned, the Anti-Injunction Act was argued the first day. And that was the one part of the argument that I didn't handle personally. And in some ways, maybe that's the easiest. When you're sitting as co-counsel, you're not the arguing counsel. That's one of the best jobs in the business, right? You can you sit there, you can, you're right in the middle of the action, but you don't really have to do too much. And you can listen to everything, and you know the case, so you can perceive everything. So I was at, I was at arguing counsel's table, but I didn't argue the case. And walking out of that argument, I did say, well, that went great, but there's only one thing that bothered me a little bit, and it's one question the Chief Justice asked. Um, but then I have to say that the next day, when the constitutional issue of the taxing power should have come up, if at all, um, it didn't really come up. And so I felt much better walking out of the argument on the individual mandate, because I sort of thought, well, if the tax power were a big holdup, it would have gotten a lot more play than it actually did at the argument. But it didn't seem like it was weighing on anybody's mind and not the Chief Justice's mind either. So it was really the question from the first day that, 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 that sort of triggered a reaction. But by the second day, I was feeling better. Other thing I'd say just about reactions to this argument, um, it was fascinating to watch some of the commentators talk about this argument afterwards. And I think it was a very unique phenomenon. Because as I mentioned, from the beginning, there were an awful lot of people dismissing this lawsuit as frivolous. And even, again, as I alluded to, there were people on the eve of argument, somewhat inexplicably in light of the six hours of argument, continuing to say, ah, this isn't going anywhere. Um, and, I, and I think in a way, the fact that most of the media reporting the argument thought that it was a disaster for the government and really thought the challengers were going to win kind of cleanly based on the arguments was in part, you know, they'd been told for so long by so many people that this challenge was frivolous, and whatever else was clear from the argument, the court wasn't treating it as frivolous. And so I think that was also, I mean, not, not that sort of we overreacted to that, but in sort of thinking about the broader public reaction to the argument, I think those expectations were a big part of it. I saw another hand up over here when I was calling on Bill. Am I wrong about that? Okay. I think we have time for a couple more questions. Michael. As you mentioned, there was tremendous uh, public interest in this case, maybe unprecedented. Um, and so it, it uh, really provided the court with a unique opportunity to educate the public about the Constitution and about the role of um, the Supreme Court in interpreting the Constitution. I'm wondering if you have any perception as to whether that uh, educational opportunity informed anything that the court did um, in the, uh, the unique processes or the way the, uh, the opinions were written or anything like that. It's a great question. I wish I had a great answer for it. And I think, you know, it's one of these things where if one of the justices wants to donate their papers, uh, you know, many years hence, that we might find out more of the answer to that. It's something you really would have to be behind the scenes to know. I mean, I, I, I have to say it probably did contribute, if to nothing else, to the length of the argument and the fact that the court uh, kind of went out of its way to treat the, the, the challenge very seriously and very carefully, because I think they knew that really an unprecedented number of people uh, were watching the decision. Bill, you had a question? You obviously 
he obviously did a phenomenal job in overcoming a lot of obstacles. We all second guess ourselves. Have you done any of that? Have you thought about anything that could have been said that would have made a difference? Well, it's, it's a fair question, but it's, you know, it's a hard question to answer in the following sense, which is obviously knowing what I know now, would I do things differently? Sure. I'd start with the taxing power. Um, and, 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 you know, every time somebody tried to ask me about the commerce power, I'd say, no, that's easy. Don't worry about the, co but let me tell you about the taxing power. And here's why. And, you know, and, and there is, and it, to be serious about this, you know, one of the things that could be said about the taxing power is even if it's reconfigured as a tax, there's a serious question, which the court didn't spend a lot of time on, as to whether or not, if it is a tax, it's still constitutional or whether it's an unconstitutional, unapportioned direct tax. And I would have loved to have been able to engage on that topic um, if I thought that's where the case was going to come down on, because I think there's a strong argument uh, that if it is a tax, it's still problematic because it's an unapportioned direct tax. Um, and I actually, for what it's worth, I mean, based on that sort of concern from the first day of argument, the only place I really know of that the taxing power came up in the individual mandate argument was when I brought it up gratuitously just so I could say something about the direct tax issue since it hadn't really been a focus of the briefing. Um, so there are lots of things I would do different. But I have to say, if I would have told my clients, not knowing what I know now, that, guys, I think that you know, this case is all going to turn on the taxing power. Um, and we got to sort of you know, stop focusing on the commerce power and just flip, flip the order of the brief around. I think I would have been fired. Because, uh, you know, you have to remember, there were, you know, there were all these lower courts that I talked about. None of the lower court decisions went off on the taxing power. You know, the courts that thought it was constitutional thought it was constitutional because some combination of the commerce power and the necessary and proper power are incredibly broad. Uh, the ones that thought that it was unconstitutional, um, you know, focused on those same arguments and, you know, you know, did not take the taxing power issue as being particularly the focus of attention. I think in the 11th Circuit opinion, even the dissenting judge, you know, said, yeah, taxing power, government's taxing power argument doesn't, doesn't go anywhere. And it was the fallback argument for the federal government as well. I mean, in fairness, in part for the reasons that the Chief Justice opinion made clear, is that it's not an argument that really works on a natural reading of the statute. Plus, the federal government's got a tricky job to do, just like the Chief Justice did, which is they just got through having to tell the court that, you know, it's not a tax for purposes of the Anti-Injunction Act, and then to shift gears is a little bit hard. So, sure, knowing what I know now, I, I do things very differently, but it's one of these things where I think at the time, uh, that's not where the action was. That's not where the focus was. I think we will leave it there for large collective purposes, but we are going to have a reception right out here in the Zilber Forum, and if you want to press a point on Mr. Clement, um, uh, He's accustomed to taking them from at least nine people at a time. Uh, <laughs> so we will leave him to his own devices. Paul, I want to thank you so much for coming back to Milwaukee and delivering an outstanding college.